This is Michael Borenstein, and welcome back. In this module, I'm going to talk about heterogeneity. This is the issue of whether the impact of a treatment is reasonably consistent across populations or if it varies substantially. For more information on these videos, go to metaanalysisworkshops.com. This material is also covered in our text, Common Mistakes in Meta-Analysis and How to Avoid Them. If you look at almost any paper that reports a meta-analysis, you'll find that the focus is almost entirely on the mean effect size. Relatively little is said about heterogeneity in effect sizes. For example, the paper might report that the mean effect size is 0.50. Uh, it might provide a confidence interval for the mean, and it tells us that the mean is or is not statistically significant. By contrast, the results reported for heterogeneity are superficial. The paper usually reports a Q value, I squared and Tau squared. These are intended to quantify heterogeneity, but as we will see momentarily, it don't really tell us how much the effect size varies. Similarly, the discussion section of the paper focuses almost entirely on the mean effect size and largely ignores the dispersion in effects. While this is a common approach, it is nevertheless a serious mistake. We really need to understand how much the effect size varies across studies. In a few moments, I'll introduce a meta-analysis of studies that assessed the impact of a drug to improve cognitive function in adults with ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. The effect size index is a standardized difference in means. Suppose that an effect size in this range would be considered trivial, an effect size in this range would be considered moderately useful, and an effect size in this range would be considered exceptionally useful. As it turns out, the mean effect size is 0.50. But what about the dispersion in effects? If the dispersion in effects looks like this, where the treatment has a similar effect in all studies, it would make sense to focus on the mean. If the effects look like this, we might focus on the mean, but also discuss the dispersion. By contrast, in a case like this, where the treatment has no impact in some populations but is exceptionally helpful in others, the mean is relatively uninformative. The focus should be on the range of effects. The statistics generally reported for heterogeneity do not tell us whether the distribution of effects looks like this, like this, or like this. For example, many papers use I-squared to quantify heterogeneity and to classify heterogeneity as being low, moderate, or high. An I-squared value of 50% is generally considered to reflect a moderate amount of heterogeneity. You'll probably be surprised to learn that an I-squared value of 50% could correspond to this, or to this, or to this. As a matter of fact, an I-squared value of 75% could also correspond to this, or to this, or to this. I suspect that the reason researchers offer vague descriptions of heterogeneity is that they don't know what the dispersion of effects actually is. Since we don't actually know how much the effect size varies, we resort to vague phrases like a moderate amount of heterogeneity or a lot of heterogeneity, which really have no meaning without additional context. And then we focus on the mean, which is something that we do understand. This is unfortunate for three reasons. One reason is that a key strength of a meta-analysis, as opposed to a single study, is that the meta-analysis allows us to see how much an effect size varies across a range of studies. After we've invested so much time and resources collecting the data, it seems that we ought to use it effectively. Second, an analysis that focuses on the mean and ignores heterogeneity 
can be seriously misleading. If we report that the effect is clinically important and statistically significant, most readers will assume that this applies to all populations. If the mean effect size is statistically significant, but the impact is nil or even harmful in some populations, we need to say that. And third, the process of understanding how much the effect size varies is really very simple. The confusion exists only because we work with statistics, such as the Q value, I squared, and TOA squared, that don't actually tell us what we need to know. If we simply report the relevant statistics, we could bypass all of these problems. My goal in this module is to provide you with a vocabulary that allows you to discuss heterogeneity in a clear and informative manner. This video includes five parts. I'm going to list them here so that you know the framework for this lesson. Part one, heterogeneity in a primary study. I'm going to start by reviewing how we think about heterogeneity in a primary study, in other words, a regular study, and then we'll turn to meta-analysis. The key to understanding heterogeneity in a meta-analysis is to keep in mind that it's pretty much the same as in a primary study. Part two, forget what you know. If you already work with meta-analysis, the chances are that most of what you know about heterogeneity is wrong. For example, I squared does not tell us how much the effect size varies across studies. In this section, I'll address these common mistakes. I will also explain what statistic does tell us how much the effect size varies. Part three, the various statistics typically reported for heterogeneity don't actually tell us how much the effect size varies. So what do they tell us? In this section, I'll address this question, and I'll also show how I would report heterogeneity in a meta-analysis. Part four, what is the role of heterogeneity in a meta-analysis? Now that we know how to quantify heterogeneity, what do we do with it? Some researchers say that the presence of heterogeneity reduces the quality of a meta-analysis. Is that true? Part five, this part is a statistical appendix. I'll provide a framework for understanding how the various statistics are related to each other and how they are computed. Part one, heterogeneity in a primary study. The idea of heterogeneity in a meta-analysis is actually very similar to the idea of heterogeneity in a primary study. I'm going to start with a primary study and review how we think about heterogeneity there. Then I'll show how we can apply the same framework to a meta-analysis. Consider a primary study where we want to assess the scores on a math test for all students in a school. This is a standardized test where a score of 50 indicates that the student is performing at grade level. A score below 30 indicates that the students are performing a full grade lower than expected, and a score above 70 indicates that the students are performing a full grade higher than expected. We sample 100 students from the school and record their scores on the test. We report that the mean score is 50 points. We also report the standard deviation of these scores. Suppose we report that the standard deviation is five points. If we assume that the scores follow a normal distribution, we can plot the distribution of scores based on this mean and standard deviation. We intuitively understand that most students score in the range of 40 to 60. How? Because if the scores are normally distributed, some 95% of students will score within two standard deviations of the mean. The mean minus two standard deviations is 40, as indicated by the line here, and the mean plus two standard deviations is 60, as indicated by the line here. This interval is called a prediction interval. The reason is that if we were asked to predict the score for any one student selected at random from the school, 
we would predict that the student would score between 40 and 60, and we'd be correct roughly 95% of the time. Another 5% of students fall to the left of this point or to the right of this point. Suppose the standard deviation was 10. The prediction interval would look like this. And suppose the standard deviation was 20. The prediction interval would look like this. Let me call your attention to four points. First, the information about the dispersion is important. The mean is the same in all three cases, but the three cases are obviously very different from each other. Here, we might say that all students are performing at grade level. Here, we might say that there is substantial variation in the scores, but all students are performing close enough to grade level so that we can continue without changes. By contrast, here we might say that some students are too far behind and some are too far ahead. We might want to offer remedial teaching for these and advanced teaching for these. The point I want to make here is that simply reporting the mean is not enough. We need to also know how widely the scores vary, and we need that in a format that actually gives us the numbers. The reason I mention this is that the same holds true in a meta-analysis. It's not sufficient to focus on the mean. We need to address heterogeneity as well. Second, the standard deviation is not informative on its own. Rather, it's informative because we know how to take the standard deviation and use that to compute the prediction interval. Here, I reported that the standard deviation was 5, but I could have also reported that the prediction interval was 40 to 60. Here, I reported that the standard deviation was 10, but I could have also reported that the prediction interval was 30 to 70. And here, I reported that the standard deviation was 20, but I could have also reported that the prediction interval was 10 to 90. The reason I mention this is that when we get to meta-analysis, there will be times when we want to skip the standard deviation and simply report the prediction interval. Third, there are a whole set of other statistics that we compute as interim steps to get to the standard deviation and prediction interval. First, we compute the sum of squares and the degrees of freedom. We divide one by the other to get the variance. The square root of the variance gives us the standard deviation, and we use that to compute the prediction interval. However, when we want to discuss the heterogeneity, we jump directly to the standard deviation or the prediction interval. We understand that the other numbers are simply interim steps in the computation. If we reported only the sum of squares and the variance, the reader would be lost because these statistics don't tell us how much the effects vary. I mentioned that for the following reason. In a meta-analysis, the statistics that are typically reported are analogous to the sum of squares and the variance. They don't tell us how much the effect size varies. We need to understand that and not try to use them as indices of dispersion. And fourth, we should not confuse the prediction interval with the confidence interval. These are two entirely separate things. The confidence interval is an index of precision, and it tells us how precisely we have estimated the mean. It is a property of the sample, and it's computed as the mean plus or minus two standard error. By contrast, the prediction interval is an index of dispersion, and it tells us how widely the scores vary. It is a property of the population, and it's computed as the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. Consider the example where the mean was 50 and the prediction interval was 10 to 90. We can also report a confidence interval. If the sample included 20 students, the confidence interval would look like this. It tells us that the mean effect falls between 41 and 59. The prediction interval would look like this.
it tells us that some students score as low as 10 and some score as high as 90. If the sample included 100 students, the confidence interval would look like this. It tells us that the mean effect falls between 46 and 54. The prediction interval would look like this. It tells us that some students score as low as 10 and some score as high as 90. If the sample included 1,000 students, the confidence interval would look like this. It tells us that the mean effect falls between 49 and 51. The prediction interval would look like this. It tells us that some students score as low as 10 and some score as high as 90. The confidence interval tells us how precisely we have estimated the mean. And as such, it's driven largely by the sample size. As the sample size increases, our estimate of the mean becomes more precise. With 20 students, we know the mean within 18 points. With 100 students, we know the mean within 8 points. With 1,000 students, we know the mean within 2 points. By contrast, the prediction interval tells us how widely the scores vary. And as such, it's driven primarily by the actual distribution of scores in the population. If there are kids in the school who score as low as 10 and others who score as high as 90, that remains true regardless of how many kids we include in our sample. The main thing I want you to take from this is that the confidence interval tells us nothing about the heterogeneity. I mention this here because this is a common mistake in meta-analysis. Papers report the confidence interval and readers sometimes assume that this reflects the dispersion in effects. It does not. With that as background, let's return to meta-analysis. Part two, forget what you know. When we ask about heterogeneity, we typically intend to ask how much the effects vary. Therefore, when a paper reports statistics such as the Q value or I squared, we may assume that these statistics address our question. As it turns out, that assumption is incorrect. These statistics do not tell us how much the effect size varies. My goal in this section is to explain that using both logic and an example. And then I'll move on to the prediction interval, which is the only statistic that actually does tell us how much the effect size varies. The first thing we need to be clear about is what we have in mind when we ask about heterogeneity. As an example, I'm going to use a meta-analysis that looks at the impact of a treatment for adults with ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. This is a condition where people have trouble concentrating. The goal of the treatment is to improve a patient's cognitive function. The analysis is based on 17 studies. Each study was a randomized controlled trial where the patients were assigned to receive either methylphenidate or a placebo. At the end of the study, the patients were assessed on a scale of cognitive function. The effect size index is the standardized difference in means, also known as D. An effect size of zero would indicate that the drug offers no improvement over a placebo. An effect size of 0.20 would be considered a small effect. This is an effect that would be visible on the test scores, but the patient might not be aware of any change in their behavior. An effect size of 0.50 would be considered a moderate effect. The patient would know that they were doing better than usual, and the change might even be obvious to some colleagues. An effect size of 0.80 would be considered a large effect. The patient would feel that this was the kind of day they typically had only a few times a year, and some colleagues would likely remark on the change. As a shorthand, I'll call these effects small, moderate, and large. Let's run through the ADHD example to see how this works. In this example, I'll be using the software Comprehensive Meta-Analysis, or CMA, but all of this applies to any software that you might be using. If you'd like to follow along with a free trial of CMA, you can download it at metaanalysis.com. I'll open the file in CMA. Typically, we would enter the mean, standard deviation, and sample size for each study, 
But in this example, the authors did not report these values since each study used a different scale to measure cognitive function. Rather, for each study, the authors reported the standardized mean difference along with the standard error. So that's what we entered into CMA. This column holds the standardized mean difference. This column holds the standard error. We don't have the sample size, so we leave that blank. This column is for the effect direction. I choose auto. This means that any effect entered as a positive number will be positive, and any effect entered as a negative number will be negative. I click Run Analysis, and this is the main analysis screen. I'll select Random Effects at the bottom. This will allow me to generalize the results of these 17 studies to the universe of all comparable populations, and it allows me to discuss the heterogeneity in effects. First, we want to have a look at the mean effect size. The mean is 0.506, which I'll round to 0.50 for this discussion. The confidence interval for the mean is roughly 0.35 to 0.65. In the universe of populations from which these studies were sampled, the mean probably falls in that range. We can test the null hypothesis that the mean effect size in the universe of comparable populations is zero. In other words, that the drug is no more effective than a placebo. The test yields a Z value of 6.86 and a P value of less than 0.001. We reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the drug is more effective than a placebo. To see the heterogeneity statistics, I click on Next Table. The display here is divided into two parts. This part deals with the mean effect size, and the statistics here are the same as the ones we saw on the prior screen. I'll click Format Increase Decimals. I'll be using these values later, and I'll be using four decimal places in those computations. The mean effect size is 0 0.5058, and the confidence interval for the mean is 0 0.3613 to 0 0.6503. This part deals with dispersion in effects, and here I can pick up the values for heterogeneity. The Q value is 30.1065, degrees of freedom is 16, the p-value is 0.0175. I-squared is 46.8553%. Tau-squared is 0 0.0387. And Tau is 0.1966. As we saw, the mean effect size is roughly 0.50, with a confidence interval of around 0.35 to 0.65. Now, let's look at the heterogeneity. First, let's be clear what we mean by heterogeneity and why it's important. When we ask about heterogeneity, we're asking what the distribution of effects looks like. There are an infinite number of possibilities, and I'll use three for purposes of this illustration. Does the distribution of effects look like this? In all populations, the treatment has a moderate effect. From a clinical perspective, we might say that the effect size is essentially the same in all comparable populations. Or does the distribution of effects look like this? There are some populations where the effect is small, some where it's moderate, and some where it's large. We might decide that we should begin using the drug now but should initiate research to determine where the impact is relatively small and where the impact is relatively large, since this would allow us to use the drug more efficiently. Or does the distribution of effects look like this? There are some populations where the effect is virtually zero, and others where this is an unusually potent treatment. We may or may not want to start using the drug now, but would certainly initiate new research to exploit the drug's potential. So that's what we mean by heterogeneity 
and that's why it's important. To avoid any confusion, I should note that the confidence interval does not tell us anything about heterogeneity. The mean effect is around 0.50, with a confidence interval of 0.35 to 0.65. The confidence interval is an index of precision, not an index of dispersion. It tells us that the mean effect falls between 0.35 and 0.65, but the dispersion of effects could look like any of these or anything else. These are the statistics typically reported for heterogeneity. A moment ago, I showed where to find them in CMA. The first thing I want to do is to show that these statistics don't actually tell us how much the effect size varies. The first statistics generally reported for heterogeneity are the Q value, the degrees of freedom, and a P value. In this example, Q is 30.106 with 16 degrees of freedom and a P value of 0 0.017. On that basis, does the distribution of effects look like this? or like this, or like this? The answer is there's no way to know. Given this Q value and P value, it could be any of these. The next statistic reported is generally the I squared value. In this analysis, I squared is 47%. This is probably the most common mistake related to heterogeneity. There is an almost universal belief that I squared tells us how much the effect size varies across studies. But the fact is, this is incorrect. And I can show that very simply. Given that I squared is 47%, does the distribution of effects look like this, or this, or this? The answer is, there's no way to know. Along these lines, Researchers sometimes use I-squared to classify heterogeneity as being low, moderate, or high. On that basis, an I-squared value of 47% would be classified as moderate. Again, does the distribution of effects look like this, or like this, or like this? You probably guessed incorrectly. When I teach this workshop in person, Almost nobody guesses correctly. But the more important point is that this is a guess. It must be a guess because I squared simply does not provide that information. Given that the value of I squared is 47%, the actual distribution could be any of these. And we'll get back to that momentarily. And finally, researchers would report that toy squared the variance of true effects is 0 0.039. On that basis, does the distribution of effects look like this, or like this, or like this? Actually, it is possible to get that information from Tor squared, but most researchers don't know how. And finally, we have Tor, which is the standard deviation of true effects. This is the statistic that we actually can use to learn how the effects vary. And we do that using the same approach that we used in the primary study. We compute a prediction interval. For clarity, I'll use round numbers. The mean is roughly 0.50, and the standard deviation is roughly 0.20. The mean minus two standard deviations is 0.10, and the mean plus two standard deviations is 0.90. So the prediction interval is 0.10 to 0.90. If we were asked to predict the effect size for any one population selected at random from the universe of relevant populations, we would predict that the effect size would fall in the interval of 0.10 to 0.90. And we would be correct 95% of the time. As I explained earlier, when we're working with a primary study, we can report either the standard deviation or the prediction interval. So if this was a primary study, I could report either that the standard deviation is 0.20 or that the prediction interval is 0.10 to 0.90. The translation from one to the other is intuitive. By contrast, because this is a meta-analysis, we need to actually perform the computation 
and report the prediction interval. There are two reasons for that. First, in a primary study, the estimates of the mean and the standard deviation are typically based on a sample of 30 or more subjects and therefore are reasonably precise. By contrast, in a meta-analysis, these estimates may be based on only a handful of studies and therefore are less precise. When we compute the prediction interval, we adjust it to take account of that imprecision. Second, when the effect size is a mean difference or a standardized mean difference, we can get a rough estimate of the interval using the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. The mean and the standard deviation are all in the same metric. However, when we're working with risk ratios, odds ratios, correlations, or other indices, the mean is reported in one metric, while the standard deviation is reported in another metric. And therefore, we need to convert all the numbers to a common metric before computing the prediction interval. For these reasons, we use software to actually compute the interval and then report the prediction interval ourselves. In this example, our rough estimate yielded a prediction interval of 0.10 to 0.90. With the adjustments, the software estimates the prediction interval as 0.06 to 0.96. I'll show that in a few minutes, but first I want to discuss the other statistics. Part three, what did the other statistics tell us? When we ask about heterogeneity, we generally intend to ask, how much do the effects vary? However, there are other questions that we might ask as well. In this section, I identify three distinct questions that we might ask, and I explain that each statistic is intended to address one specific question. I explain what the q-value and p-value tell us, I explain what I square tells us, and I explain what the prediction interval tells us. The key point is that each of these statistics addresses a specific question. The q-value, p-value, and i-squared do not tell us how much the effect size varies. Only the prediction interval provides that information. To this point, I showed that the other statistics, such as q and i-squared, do not tell us how much the effect size varies. So, what do they tell us? At the end of this module, I include an appendix where I'll explain each of these statistics in detail. Right now, I'll offer an overview. To explain these statistics, I need to provide some background information. In a primary study, such as the school example, we generally treat the observed score as the true score. If a student scores 70 on a test, we assume that the student's true score is 70. So we're working with one distribution of scores. If the distribution of observed scores looks like this, the distribution of true scores also looks like this. If we want to ask about the dispersion in scores, there's only one question to ask, which is how much do the scores vary? And the answer is given by the standard deviation or the prediction interval. By contrast, in a meta-analysis, we make a distinction between the true effects and the observed effects. If a study is based on a sample drawn from a hospital, the true effect size is the effect size that we would have seen if we could have enrolled the entire population in the study, while the observed effect size is the effect size that we actually see in our sample. The observed effect size serves as an estimate of the true effect size, but because of sampling error, the estimate will not be the same as the true effect size. The observed effects are what we see, but the true effects are what we care about. The distribution of observed effects includes variance in the true effects plus variance due to sampling error. For that reason, it tends to be wider than the distribution of true effects. In the ADHD analysis, if we could plot the distribution of observed effects, it would look something like this. But part of that is real, while part of it is sampling error. If we removed the sampling error, the distribution of true effects might look like this, 
or like this, or even like this. The key point is that we're working with two different distributions. The distribution of observed effects and the distribution of true effects. And the first tends to be wider than the second. Unlike the primary study, where the only question was how much did the scores vary, now there are three questions that we can ask. I can ask, is it possible that the true effect size is the same in all studies? The observed effects obviously vary from study to study. The distribution of observed effects looks like this. But we're asking about the true effects. Specifically, we're asking if it's possible that the true effects look like this. In other words, is it possible that the drug has precisely the same impact in all studies and that 100% of the dispersion that we see is due to sampling error alone? The Q-value and degrees of freedom can be used to test this hypothesis and generate a p-value. We generally use a criterion alpha of 0.1 rather than 0.05 for this test. In this case, the p-value is 0.017. We reject the null hypothesis that the true effect size is the same in all studies. We conclude that the treatment has more of an effect in some populations than in others. A second question we can ask is how to understand the dispersion in observed effects. The distribution of observed effects looks something like this, while the distribution of true effects looks something like this. We can ask about the relationship between the two distributions. Specifically, we can ask what proportion of the variance that we see here reflects variance in true effects rather than sampling error. This question is addressed by I-squared. In this analysis, I-squared is 47%, and that tells us that of the variance that we see, 47% reflects variance in true effects, while the other 53% reflects variance due to sampling error. If we could somehow get rid of the sampling error so that we could plot the true effects, that distribution would look like this. The first two questions relate to the difference between true effects and observed effects, and therefore they apply only in a meta-analysis. But a third question we can ask is, how much do the true effects vary? This is the same question that we ask in a primary study, and the answer is the same as it would be in a primary study. That question is addressed by the prediction interval. The true effect size in 95% of all comparable populations falls in the interval of 0.06 to 0.96. At one extreme, there are some populations where the treatment's effect is as low as 0.06, and at the other extreme, there are some populations where the treatment's effect is as high as 0.96. These are three legitimate questions with three valid answers. We need to be clear about what question we intend to ask and then apply the corresponding answer. If the question is, does the effect size vary at all, that answer is provided by the p-value. If the question is, what proportion of the variance is real, that answer is provided by i-squared. If the question is, how much does the effect size vary, that answer is provided by the prediction interval. The questions and answers are not interchangeable. In general, when researchers ask, are the effects heterogeneous, they intend to ask the third question, and they need to apply the third answer, which is the prediction interval. The problem that we see in the literature is that researchers sometimes think that the p-value, or i-squared, addresses the third question. They assume that the p-value, or i-squared, tells us how much the effect size varies, and this is incorrect. Consider the following analogy, uh, based on a true story. Suppose that I decide to buy a set of pearls for my wife. The reasons aren't important. Anyone can forget an anniversary. It happens. But in any event, I walk into the jewelry department at Neiman Marcus. I pick out a set of pearls, and I ask the salesperson 
how much they cost. Suppose she says, well, we're not giving them away for free. I would assume that's her way of being funny. Or maybe the last customer passed out when he heard the price and she's trying to break me in gently. But whatever the reason for her answer, two things are true. First, it's not informative. I already knew that the pearls were not free. And second, her answer is not responsive to my question. I asked how much the pearls cost. The answer, more than zero, does not tell me what I wanted to know. This experience would be analogous to the p-value in a meta-analysis. When I ask about heterogeneity, I'm asking how much the effect size varies. A significant p-value tells me that it varies more than zero. And there are two things I can say about this answer. First, it's not informative. If I'm pulling studies from the literature, I can generally assume that the true effect size varies, so I don't need a p-value to confirm that. And second, the answer is not responsive. I asked how much does the effect size vary, and the answer, more than zero, is not helpful. Now, let's consider a second scenario at the department store. Suppose I ask the saleswoman how much the pearls cost, and she says, well, I know your wife, and I'll offer you a special discount. You can have the pearls for 47% of the usual price. Let's assume for the moment that I believe her. Well, this is good news. I'd like to pay only 47% of the usual price, but I still don't have the information that I asked for. I don't know what the pearls cost. If the regular cost is $100, then I'll be paying $47. If the regular cost is $1,000, then I'll be paying $470. And if the regular cost is $10,000, then I'll be paying $4,700. There are two things that we can say about the answer. First, the answer is informative. I know something now that I didn't know before. But the second thing is that the answer does not address my question. I still don't know how much I need to pay. I know that I'll pay 47% of the usual price, but I don't know if the usual price is this, this, or this, so I don't know if I'll be paying this, this, or this. This scenario would be analogous to I squared. I asked how much the effect size varies, and somebody tells me that I squared is 47%. This means that 47% of the dispersion is real, but it doesn't tell me how much dispersion there is. If I know that the observed effects look like this, and I'm told that I square is 47%, I could possibly figure out that the true effects look like this. If I know that the observed effects look like this, and I'm told that I square is 47%, I could possibly figure out that the true effects look like this. And if I know that the observed effects look like this, and I'm told that I square is 47%, I could possibly figure out that the true effects look like this. But I squared by itself tells me nothing. In this analysis, I know that I squared is 47%, but I don't know if the observed effects look like this, or like this, or like this, and therefore I don't know if the true effects look like this, or like this, or like this. When researchers classify heterogeneity as being low, moderate, or high, this is usually based on the value of I-squared. Since I-squared does not tell us how much the effects vary, this classification is meaningless. In this example, based on an I-squared of 47%, they would have reported that there was moderate heterogeneity, but the actual heterogeneity could have looked like any of these or anything else. The only exception is when I squared is zero. In that case, the variance will always be estimated as zero. Returning to the analogy, if the salesperson tells me that I'll pay 47% of the usual price, it would be reasonable for me to report that I was being offered a good discount, but it would not be reasonable for me to say 
that the cost was moderate. To say that the cost was moderate, I'd need to know the actual cost. $47, $470, or $4,700. Similarly, we might say that an I-squared value of 47% is a moderate proportion. But to say that there is a moderate amount of variance, we need to know if we're looking at this, or this, or this. And I-squared does not provide that information. Because I-squared is so widely used and so widely misunderstood, I've prepared an entire module on I-squared, and that module is part of this series. Finally, suppose that I ask the salesperson the cost of the pearls, and she says the price is $8,000. That answer is informative, and it actually is the information that I ask for. It might not be what I had hoped to hear, but at least I know what the situation is so I can make an informed decision about how to proceed. The analogy to meta-analysis would be if I ask about heterogeneity and I'm given the prediction interval. I'm told that the effect size varies from 0.06 in some populations to 0.96 in others. When I want to consider the potential utility of the intervention, this is the information that I need. There's actually another layer to this analogy. When I ask how much do these pearls cost, I don't expect too many salespeople to respond by saying, well, they're not free. But many of them would respond by saying, we can offer you a discount of 10% or 20% and so on. In my experience, relatively few would actually tell you the price. Similarly, in a meta-analysis, relatively few researchers now suggest that the p-value tells us how much the effect size varies. But the vast majority do report I-squared, and relatively few report the prediction interval. So in both the jewelry store and the meta-analysis, the most common situation is that we ask for an amount, but we're given a proportion. And this is where the analogy can be really helpful. When the salesperson says you'll pay only 47% of the usual price, I understand that this is a percentage. I'm not going to write a check for the amount of 47%. I know that doesn't make any sense. Rather, I'll say, well, thanks for the discount, but how much will I actually pay? And yet, when we're told that I-squared is 47%, we somehow convince ourselves that we know how much the effect size varies. And this makes no more sense here than it would in the jewelry store. Even if we don't understand the statistics, we should recognize that 47% is a percent. If I ask how much do the effects vary, and the response is 47%, my next question should be 47% of what? And at that point, it should become clear that I-square is addressing a different question than the one that I asked. In sum, each statistic addresses a distinct question. If we're asking whether there's evidence that the effect size varies at all, that is addressed by a test of the null hypothesis that there is zero variation in effects. If we're asking what proportion of the variance in observed effects is attributed to variance in true effects rather than sampling error, that is addressed by I-squared. If we're asking how much the effect size varies, that question is addressed by the prediction interval. In the vast majority of cases, when we ask about heterogeneity, we are asking how much the effect size varies, and therefore the answer that applies is the prediction interval. Next, I'll show how I would report the results of the analysis. I report all of these statistics, but I also explain what each one tells us. Methylphenidate for adults with ADHD. This example is a reanalysis of a systematic review published by Castells et al. in 2011. Overview. The analysis is based on 17 studies that evaluated the effect of methylphenidate on cognitive function in adults with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD.
In each study, patients were randomly assigned to either drug or a placebo, and the researchers assessed the patient's cognitive function at the conclusion of treatment. The effect size index is the standardized mean difference, D. The results of this analysis will be generalized to comparable studies, and so the random effects model was employed for the analysis. In this context, a standardized mean difference of 0.20 would be considered trivial. This is a difference that shows up on the tests, but the patient might not be aware of any change. A standardized mean difference of 0.50 would be considered moderate. The patient would recognize that they were doing better than usual, and coworkers might be aware of a change. A standardized mean difference of 0.80 would be considered large. The patient would feel great, and the difference would be obvious enough that others might remark on it. First, we address the mean effect. Does methylphenidate affect cognitive scores? The standardized mean difference is 0.506. On average, methylphenidate increased cognitive functioning by 0.506 standard deviations as compared with a placebo. The confidence interval for the standardized mean difference is 0.361 to 0.650, which tells us that the mean effect size in the universe of comparable studies could fall anywhere in this range. This range does not include an effect size of zero, which tells us that the mean effect size is probably not zero. Similarly, the Z value for testing the null hypothesis that D is 0.0, .0 is 6.862, with a corresponding P value of less than 0 0.001. We can reject the null hypothesis and conclude that, on average, the drug does increase cognitive function in the universe of populations which are comparable to those in the analysis. Then we look at the heterogeneity. How much does the effect size vary across studies? The Q statistic provides a test of the null hypothesis that all studies in the analysis share a common effect size. If all studies shared the same effect size, the expected value of Q would be equal to the degrees of freedom, which is the number of studies minus one. The Q value is 30.106 with 16 degrees of freedom and a P value of 0.017. We reject the null hypothesis that the true effect size is identical in all the studies. The I square statistic is 47%, which tells us that 47% of the variance in observed effects reflects variance in true effects rather than sampling error. The variance of true effects, tau squared, is 0.039, and the standard deviation of true effects, tau, is 0.197. The prediction interval is 0.058 to 0.954. We would expect that in some 95% of all populations comparable to those in the analysis, the true effect size will fall in this range. And based on the context outlined above, this means that there will be some populations where the impact of the treatment is trivial and some where it is large. So that's the way I would summarize the results of this analysis. As I mentioned earlier, we should always use software to get a more accurate estimate of the prediction interval. This software can be downloaded at www.meta-analysis-workshops.com. As I write this, the software reports the prediction interval without a plot, but that will be updated soon to the version I'm going to show here. We need to enter four values into this program. The mean effect size is 0.5058, the upper limit of the confidence interval is 0.6503. Tor squared is 0.0387. And note that we use Tor squared and not Tor. And finally, the number of studies is 17. The program produces this plot and this text. This line shows the mean and the confidence interval. It corresponds to this caption, which reads, 
The mean effect size is 0.506 with a 95% confidence interval of 0.361 to 0.650. This curve tells us how the true effect size varies across populations. The curve is summarized by this caption, which reads, the true effect size in 95% of all comparable populations falls in the interval 0.058 to 0.954. The prediction interval is 0.058 to 0.954, which corresponds to the endpoints of this distribution. The plot itself provides a more nuanced visual display. Using the criteria I outlined above, we can get a sense that the impact of the treatment is small in roughly 20% of populations, moderate in roughly 60%, and large in roughly 20%. Critically, the treatment is not harmful in any populations, at least not in the 95% displayed here. I should be clear that my criteria for saying that an effect size of 0.20 is small or that 0.50 is moderate is subjective. Others will feel differently and therefore will have different ideas about how to proceed. That discussion is both necessary and welcome. The purpose of the prediction interval is to provide a basis for that discussion. If we report the prediction interval, then we all have a common understanding of how the effect size varies. And on that basis, we can have a meaningful discussion about whether to recommend using the drug now and about how to plan future research. By contrast, if we only report Q, I squared, and Tau squared, we don't actually know how the effect sizes are distributed. And without a clear sense of how the effects are distributed, we cannot have a meaningful discussion about the potential utility of the drug. Part four, what is the role of heterogeneity in a meta-analysis? To this point, I've explained that many of the statistics generally cited as indices of heterogeneity don't actually tell us how much the effect size varies. And I've presented a statistic, the prediction interval, which does tell us how much the effect size varies. Now that we have that index, I want to discuss how to use it. Put simply, if we know how much the effect size varies, what role should that play in a meta-analysis? Point one. Once again, I need to debunk some common beliefs. There's a common belief in some fields of research that heterogeneity is bad. In medicine, for example, it's sometimes said that the presence of heterogeneity reduces the quality of a meta-analysis. I've even seen papers suggest that in the presence of heterogeneity, a meta-analysis provides no useful information. The reality is much more complicated. The presence of substantial heterogeneity does determine what we can learn from an analysis, but it does not necessarily make the analysis less useful. For purposes of this discussion, it helps to think of two classes of meta-analysis. First, consider a meta-analysis to assess the impact of a new drug. Suppose that we define the universe very narrowly. All studies in the analysis enroll patients from very similar populations. We all employ the same dosage of the drug over the same time span. In this case, we hope that any variation in the effects will be trivial. If the variation is trivial, the mean effect size will be informative. On the other hand, if the variation is substantial, the mean effect will not be terribly informative since the actual effect in any given population falls substantially below or above the mean. Additionally, it seems unlikely that we will be able to identify any factors that might be associated with the heterogeneity since we believe that all the studies are identical to each other on all relevant factors. In this example, the heterogeneity would indeed be a problem. When someone says that heterogeneity reduces the quality of information, this is the kind of analysis they have in mind. The information produced by this kind of analysis 
is intended to be a common effect size. And if there is no common effect size, the utility of the information is indeed reduced. By contrast, consider the meta-analysis that we looked at a moment ago to assess the impact of methylphenidate on the cognitive functioning of adults with ADHD. In that analysis, the universe was defined broadly. Different studies enrolled different types of people, different studies employed different doses of the drug, and differed in other potentially important ways as well. Critically, the analysis included enough studies so that we could quantify the extent of dispersion reliably. If it turned out, as it did, that the effect size varied substantially across studies, that in itself is an important finding. Now that we know that the effect size varies, and we know how much it varies, we need to understand why it varies so that we can use the drug more effectively. The key point is that when we are prepared to assess heterogeneity, the presence of heterogeneity makes the analysis more useful, not less useful. Point two, most papers talk about the mean effect size as one issue and about heterogeneity as a separate issue. This is a serious mistake. We need to think about heterogeneity in conjunction with the mean effect size. Suppose that an effect size to the right of zero indicates that the treatment is helpful, while an effect size to the left of zero indicates that the treatment is harmful. When we talk about heterogeneity by itself, we're asking if the variation in effects looks like this, or like this, or like this. That's important, but we also need to know the location of these effects. For example, suppose that the amount of heterogeneity looks like this. There's obviously a critically important difference between this distribution and this one. In both cases, the amount of dispersion is the same, but here the effects range from a small positive effect to a large positive effect, whereas here there are some populations where the intervention is actually harmful. We only see that when we look at the heterogeneity and the mean in relation to each other. And that's what we're doing with the prediction interval. To be clear, when we report that a treatment's effect is statistically significant, and clinically important, we're talking only about the mean effect size. It's still possible that the intervention might be harmful in a non-trivial proportion of populations. This problem is not only theoretical. Intout et al. recently published a paper showing that there are many analyses where the mean effect size is helpful and statistically significant, but the distribution looks like this with the treatment being harmful in some cases. I'll show one example of why it's important to look at the heterogeneity and mean together rather than separately. This is an analysis of studies that looked at the impact of GLP-1 mimetics on diastolic blood pressure. The analysis was performed by Katut et al and published in the American Journal of Hypertension in January 2014. The effect size index is a raw difference in means, specifically in the diastolic blood pressure. The intent is to reduce blood pressure, so an effect size to the left of zero indicates that the drug was helpful, while an effect size to the right of zero indicates that the drug was harmful. If we focus on the mean effect size, we would report that the mean is minus 0.47 with a 95% confidence interval of minus 1.20 to plus 0.25. From a clinical point of view, the mean effect size is trivial. And since the confidence interval includes zero, the true mean might actually be zero. Similarly, the p-value for a test of the null hypothesis that the mean effect size is zero is 0.199. So if we were to focus on the mean, the take home message would be that the drug has no clinically important effect. By contrast, 
Look what happens when we also look at the heterogeneity. While the mean effect is near zero, the effect size in any single population could be clinically helpful or clinically harmful. At one extreme, there are some populations where the drug reduces blood pressure by as much as four millimeters of mercury. And at the other extreme, there are some populations where the drug increases blood pressure by as much as three millimeters of mercury. When the effects vary this widely, the mean is simply the average of two competing effects and is not terribly relevant. Rather, we need to focus on the dispersion itself and try to understand where the treatment is helpful and where it's harmful. When the prediction interval indicates that the treatment is helpful in some cases and harmful in others, I always want to map this back to the data. I want to be sure that there actually are cases that show a helpful effect and others that show a harmful effect. And that is the case here. There are a good number of studies where the effect size falls on either side of zero, and among them are some where the effect is statistically significant. I'm also seeing this pattern of effects in meta-analyses that look at the impact of treatments for COVID-19, and that appear to be helpful in some cases and harmful in others. I plan to include those in later modules. Next, I need to discuss some important limitations related to our estimates of heterogeneity. Researchers sometimes fail to appreciate how poor the estimates of heterogeneity may be. And this applies to all statistics related to heterogeneity. Consider a primary study where we want to estimate the math scores for all students in a school. Would we conduct a study with five students? Of course not. We can't accurately estimate the mean and standard deviation for all students in the school based on a sample of five students unless all students in the school have scores that are very similar to each other. But that's essentially what we're trying to do in a meta-analysis with five studies. And that holds true even if each study includes thousands of subjects. If we're working with studies that are all very similar to each other, our results may be reliable. But if the true effect size varies across studies, we need more studies to get a reliable estimate of heterogeneity. There's no rule of thumb for how many studies are needed to yield a reliable estimate of heterogeneity. When people press me for a number, I use the number 10, but I intend that primarily to provide a sense of scale. In other words, the number is not three. While I cannot say how many studies we need to yield a reliable estimate of heterogeneity, there are some general principles we can keep in mind. First, when the analysis uses a narrow set of inclusion-exclusion criteria, we need fewer studies to yield a reliable estimate of heterogeneity. Conversely, when the criteria are set more broadly, we'll need more studies. Second, when the included studies are large, we will need fewer studies to yield a reliable estimate of heterogeneity. Conversely, when the studies are smaller, we need more studies to yield a reliable estimate. In some fields of research, it's common to have only a handful of studies in a meta-analysis. In these cases, how can we deal with the fact that our estimate of heterogeneity may not be reliable? Well, if the studies were selected to be very similar to each other, I may be willing to assume that the effect size is consistent across studies based on my understanding of the field rather than the estimates that I get from the analysis itself. We see a lot of this, for example, in Cochrane. This is not optimal, of course, but it is a practical solution since we simply don't have enough data. On the other hand, if the studies vary on a number of important dimensions, an analysis based on only a few studies simply does not have enough information to yield any reliable estimates of heterogeneity. And in that case, we need to acknowledge the limitations of the data. Part five, appendix.
I started this module by saying that the statistics generally reported for heterogeneity don't actually tell us how much the effects vary. I also provided an overview of what the various statistics do tell us. For those of you who want to know more about these statistics and how they are related to each other, the next few minutes features a statistical appendix that addresses that issue. I'll use this column to represent the observed effects. These are the effects that are actually reported for each study. And I'll use this column to represent the true effects. These are the effects that we would see in each study if we somehow included the entire population so we knew the effect size with no sampling error. In a primary study, we generally treat an observed score as being the same as the true score. So we're dealing with only one set of numbers. By contrast, in a meta-analysis, we recognize that the observed effect size in any study will differ from the true effect size because of sampling error. And therefore, we're working with two sets of numbers. The observed effects are the effects that we see. These are the effects that are plotted in the forest plot. But the true effects are the ones that we care about. The first point I want to make is that the variance of the observed effects tends to be greater than the variance of the true effects. To see why, consider a case where the studies are all random samples from the same population. And so, by definition, the true effect size for all studies is the same. What about the observed effects? Would we expect them to look like this? Well, the answer is, of course not. If the observed effects all looked like this, we would assume that someone had made up the data. Rather, we would expect to see some variation in the observed effects due to sampling error. The observed effects might look like this. Suppose that we wanted to plot the distribution of true effects. We would use these effects to compute the sum of squared deviations. We'd use that to compute the variance. We'd use that to compute the standard deviation. And we'd use that to plot the distribution of true effects. And it would look like this. This is not really a distribution, but rather a line, since the variance is zero and the true effects are all the same. Suppose we wanted to plot the distribution of observed effects. We use these effects to compute the sum of square deviations. We use that to compute the variance. We use that to compute the standard deviation. And we use that to plot the distribution of observed effects. And it might look like this. The first point I want to make is that the distribution of the observed effects is wider than the distribution of true effects. That should be intuitive in this example. Since the distribution of true effects is zero and the distribution of observed effects is greater than zero, the distribution of observed effects must be larger than the distribution of true effects. How much larger do we expect it to be? Well, that depends on how large the studies are. Or more precisely, it depends on the error variance or the standard error of each study. If the studies are large with little sampling error, the observed effects will tend to fall close to the true effects, and the distribution of observed effects might look like this. On the other hand, if the studies are small with a lot of sampling error, the observed effects will tend to fall farther from the true effects, and the distribution of observed effects might look like this. Concretely, the variance of the observed effects is equal to the variance of the true effects plus the variance due to sampling error. If V is the variance, then V observed is equal to V true plus V error. In this case, the variance of true effects is zero, and so the variance of observed effects is simply equal to the variance due to sampling error. I started with an example where the variance of true effects is zero because this example is intuitive. 
if the variance of true effects is zero, then the variance of observed effects must be greater than the variance of true effects. However, the same idea applies in a meta-analysis where each study is based on a unique population and the true effect size varies across studies. Suppose the distribution of true effects looks like this. The distribution of observed effects would tend to be wider. As before, how much wider depends on how precise the studies are. If the studies are large, with little sampling error, the observed effects will tend to fall close to the true effects, and the distribution of observed effects might look like this. On the other hand, if the studies are small, with a lot of sampling error, the observed effects will tend to fall farther from the true effects, and the distribution of observed effects might look like this. As before, the variance of observed effects is equal to the variance of true effects plus the variance due to sampling error. As I said a few minutes ago, if we knew the true effects, we could use that to compute the sum of squares and then proceed to the other computations in this column. The problem, of course, is that we don't know the true effects. By definition, these are unknown. So how do we get the sum of squares? We're able to get it because we know the relationship between these three numbers. This is the sum of squares for the observed effects, which I'll call Q observed. This is the sum of squares that we would expect to see based on sampling error, and I'll call that Q error. And this is the sum of squares for the true effects, which I'll call Q true. This Q value is the sum of the other two. Q observed is equal to Q error plus Q true. And so it follows that Q observed minus Q error equals Q true. We can compute Q observed and Q error, and then Q observed minus Q error gives us Q true. You might be wondering how we can compute the Q value that we would expect to see based on sampling error. The answer is that in a meta-analysis, the sum of squares is standardized. That means that when we compute the deviation of each effect size from the mean, we divide that deviation by the standard error of the effect size. On this standardized scale, the value of Q that we expect to see based on sampling error is simply the degrees of freedom, which is the number of studies minus one. So by using this method, we can estimate the sum of squares for the true effects. And once we have that, we can proceed to compute the variance of the true effects the standard deviation of the true effects, and the distribution of true effects. Using this schematic, we can also understand the role played by each of the statistics. The Q value is simply the sum of squared deviations for the observed effects on a standardized scale. It can be used to test the null hypothesis that the true effect size is the same in all studies, and it can also be used as the first step in computing the variance of true effects. The key point I wanted to make is that Q in a meta-analysis is analogous to the sum of squares in a primary study. It's an interim step in computing the variance, but not very informative on its own. There is one thing we can learn from Q. If Q is less than the degrees of freedom, the dispersion that we see in the observed effects is less than we would expect to see based on error alone, and so the variance of true effects will be estimated as zero. Conversely, if Q is greater than the degrees of freedom, the dispersion that we see in the observed effects is greater than we would expect to see based on sampling error alone, and so the variance of true effects will be estimated as greater than zero. But beyond that, Q does not tell us how much the effects vary. Now let's turn to I squared. This column represents the observed effects, and this column represents the true effects. 
it would be useful to have a statistic that reflects the relationship between the two sets of data, and that statistic is I squared. To compute I squared, we take the ratio of Q true to Q observed. And to get a sense of what I squared means, I can superimpose the two plots. If I squared is high, most of the variance that we see is variance in true effects. Therefore, the plot of true effects in red will fall very close to the plot of observed effects in blue. If I squared is low, only a little of the variance that we see is variance in true effects. And therefore, the plot of true effects in red will be substantially narrower than the plot of observed effects in blue. But critically, I squared is a proportion, not an absolute value. If we know what the observed effects look like, I squared tells us what proportion of that reflects variance in true effects. But I squared by itself does not tell us how much the effects vary. Note that I squared is proportional to the variances, which are on a squared scale, while the ratio of the plots is on a linear scale. In this example, I squared is 25%. Since the ratio of the variances is 0.25, the ratio of the standard deviations is 0.50. That means that the inner plot is half as wide as the outer plot, not one-fourth as wide. And finally, we come to the prediction interval. The prediction interval is a way of summarizing the plot of true effects, which we see here. This tells us that there are some populations where the effect size falls at this extreme and others where it falls at this extreme. This gives us the range of effects in the same metric that we use for reporting the mean. And not only does it give us the extent of the dispersion, it also gives us the actual interval. So we know if the effect varies from a small benefit to a large benefit on the one hand, or from a small harm to a moderate benefit on the other. And this is what we have in mind when we ask about heterogeneity. This is what people think is being addressed by I squared, but in fact is not addressed by that statistic. Let's see how all this works with the ADHD example. We start by computing two values. These are Q, the sum of squared deviations on a standardized scale, and the degrees of freedom, which is simply the number of studies minus one. All of the other statistics are derived from these two numbers. While all of the statistics are derived from Q and DF, we need to choose the statistic that addresses our question. One question we can ask is, does the effect size vary at all across populations? If we want to test the null hypothesis that the true effects are all precisely the same, that the distribution of true effects looks like this, we use the q-value and degrees of freedom to perform a chi-square test. And this test yields a p-value of 0 0.017. We reject the null hypothesis that there's no variation in true effects, and we conclude that the effect size varies. But this says nothing about the extent of variation. A second question we can ask is, of the variance that we see in the observed effects, what proportion reflects variance in true effects rather than sampling error? And this is addressed by I squared. We can use these two values to compute Q for the true effects. 30.106 minus 16 equals 14.106. And then we can compute the ratio of this value to this one. This is the ratio of Q true to Q observed. Q is proportional to the variance, so it's also the ratio of true to total variance, which is I squared. 14.106 over 30.106 times 100 is 47%. Of the variance that we see, 47% is due to variance in true effects. We can get a visual impression of that by superimposing the two plots.
This is the distribution of observed effects, and this is the distribution of true effects. The ratio of the variance for the inner plot versus the outer plot is 47%. This helps us to understand the meaning of I squared, but it's hard to get a sense of the actual ratio from these plots, since the plots are on a linear scale, while I squared is in a squared metric. A third question we can ask is, how much do the effects vary? And it seems to me that this is almost always what we have in mind when we ask about heterogeneity. The answers are provided by the statistics in this column. Once we have the value of Q for the true effects, we can compute the variance of true effects, which is called tau squared. And here, tau squared is 0.039. While this is the statistic typically reported as the index of dispersion, it really is only an interim step toward the computation of the actual dispersion. By itself, it's not terribly intuitive. If we take the square root of tau square, we get the standard deviation of true effects called tau. Here, tau is 0.197. And then we can use the mean plus or minus 2 tau to compute the prediction interval. Here, the prediction interval based on the mean, plus or minus 2 tau, is roughly 0.10 to 0.90. In some 95% of populations comparable to those in the analysis, the true effect size will fall in this interval. For purposes of explaining what these numbers mean, I'm going to stop here. However, to actually compute the prediction interval, we would need to use software for the reasons that I explained earlier. That's it for now. Please go to metaanalysisworkshops.com, download the prediction intervals program, and learn about our workshops. These are now available online. Go to metaanalysisbooks.com to learn about our book, common mistakes in meta-analysis, and how to avoid them. And go to metaanalysis.com to learn about our software, Comprehensive Meta-Analysis. My email is michael at metaanalysis.com. Please feel free to send any comments or questions. Thanks.